us. Thank you for that. That seems in. That seems out. Oops. Let's back out. This looks like it's not tracking me. So that's good. I got it recording now. Right. I was talking out loud to myself. So if anyone notices, uh, I've had sometimes like it starts out right and then like midway through the term it starts like staring at me and I don't notice it. So if anyone sort of notices that, just kind of let me know. <laughs> Try and fix it. Okay, I am ready. So everyone, start. everyone um, we will be presenting on the Wolf Oil tragedy today, um, also known as the Union Carbide Gas Week. Um, I think we're just going to do like name introductions. So we're group number one. My name is David. I'm Rory. Uh, I'm Jeff. I'm Maddie. Raquel. Okay, so the Bhopal tragedy was, it took place on December 8th, 1984 um, in India, Bhopal, India in the Madhya Pradesh region. And at the time it was considered the worst industrial accident in history, which is saying something because I think at this point, um, Chernobyl had already happened, which I don't think was technically industrial, but still pretty large scale. Um, and it, the pesticide plant was a U.S. owned pesticide plant, which is something that we see a lot with like the U.S. going to other places where they have less safety uh, regulations. And at the time about 45 tons of methyl isinate or MIC escaped and just was completely uncontrolled and it killed thousands instantly while others fled and died as well as animals, plants. Um, there were about a half million survivors, but they had a lot of subsequent illnesses, which of course led to premature death. Um, upon investigation, they found operating errors, design flaws, maintenance failures, poor employee training, and budget cuts, which all affected the uh, safety procedures. And at the early first, early 21st century, there were still about 400 tons of waste at the site, since it hasn't been cleaned up yet. And that led to soil and water contamination, which led to chronic health issues, birth defects, barren land, um, native fish extinctions, and just overall affected the economy and agriculture and life as well there. And what specifically went wrong was there was a runaway reaction as the temperature and pressure increased inside one of their tanks without any regulation, because there was a um, pretty much complete lack of controls inside all their tanks. And then the second thing that went wrong is that the methyl isinate needed to be cooled, but the refrigeration system wasn't turned on. Um, just kind of a bad one. And then the third thing is that there was a flare tower, um, which usually like helps control the leakage of toxic gas, but that didn't work. And then the plant also had vent scrubbers in case of a gas leak so that it could clean the air. Those also didn't work. And there's a water curtain, which wasn't designed properly, it should go to the top of a flare tower and it would neutralize any escaping gas, but it wasn't tall enough, so the flare tower and the water curtain, while both didn't function at all, wouldn't have worked even if they were functional, so useless. <laughs> and then there was also an alarm system that would have at least alerted people to like start getting out, but that hadn't worked for four years. Um, so then talking more about um, kind of the lessons that we learned with um, engineering failures. So a few main issues were um, temperature control, um, poor maintenance, and poor safety training. Um, many, um, some steps taken to absolve this could have been um, better operator training. Um, there was no fast log in that. Um, which led to um, poor maintenance of heat, um, which was the work power um, actually not operating for six days prior to the accident. Um, as well as that, um, some procedures went forth that were prohibited because of improper training. 
um, such as like the pipe that was washed out that wasn't properly sealed, which led to the accident, um, which was ignored by the people working there. Um, more thorough inspection and testing of any possible defects, um, more frequently, um, and storing chemicals um, in a more secure way. So, like having them in separate smaller tanks opposed to the larger ones, um, and <coughs> simplifying the equipment so that there's less noise between the airs, and just like designing it to completely contain the MIC. As Okay, uh, so the total tragedy has taken over 30,000 lives. Uh, some are, most of them are now, some of them were from uh, an impact on the Gas Leaf. And it also led to over uh, half, a, half a million injuries and as well as permanent disabilities of the people uh, in the city. And at the time, uh, their public health infrastructure was very weak. Um, hospitals, uh, had to take care of many of the injured, and at the time, doctors uh, didn't know what uh, the MIC was, what the gas was that that the people uh, were contaminated with, and uh, running water was only available for a couple hours uh, at a time, uh, and people in the streets were just flooded with uh, lots of bu dead buffaloes, dogs, <coughs> and human corpses, and you know, they couldn't do much in this situation. And they really couldn't sustain it. Five years later, the uh, <coughs> Indian Carbide Corporation uh, uh, made a deal with the Indian government to to have uh, 400 and, uh, $470 million of damages uh, to get to the people and to help with the, uh, the gas leak. Um, but, but still over time, the people were very angry as they thought it was going on. And uh, fast forward, in 2010, the Indian, Indian government uh, gave over $280 million in aid, in aid, increasing the compensation of victims and uh, improving medical facilities in Bokal. and. This was this would finally clean up the the, the gas leaks uh, that was still there. Uh, it, was, it was still there for like more than twenty five years, and at the same time, they also convicted seven of the head managers uh, of the of the uh, pesticide plant to two years on jail for prison. I'm going to talk a little bit about the ethical part of our project. Um, <coughs> So we, as a community, as a society, as engineers mainly, have to um, basically improve and what can possibly be another disaster. So we broke it down into three things, three main uh, parts. Safety protocols, we got risk assessments, and uh, emergency response uh, planning, which is an ERP. Engineering, uh, we, both those have to because of Basically, because of safety issues. So we, as engineers, should obey strictly the uh, obey strict safety uh, protocols. And I can break down into three of those. Uh, give three examples of those. It will be a, appropriate safety equipment for for the people working in these hazard uh, factories. Training for personnel work, working there as well. We, we, we talked about a little bit. And regular maintenance and inspection of these machines, which is a big problem. Um, that happens a lot. Um, the second part we're going to touch on is a little, uh, risk assessments. Uh, risk assessments, we as engineers need to identify uh, and utilize risk assessments uh, for the possible for possible hazards that can happen. Uh, we can use uh, both as a worst case scenario uh, incident and develop the strategies that we can mitigate these accidents to uh, ever happening again. Because people are still being born to this day with the at birth, having problems at birth, uh, due to this incident. 
the ERP, the emergency planning, uh, emergency pl uh, response planning, we did. We as engineers <laughs> to develop and create and update this ERP for these hazardous hazard facilities that we should call them, uh, including evacuation procedures, medical support, because that that was a big problem that happened in Bopal, and effective channels of communication too, because apparently it was kind of chaotic when everything happened, so there was no communication going out between the emergencies. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, so with finance, <laughs> covering the finance section, it can be challenging to estimate like a number for solutions, especially considering the half a million people who were injured from this event. Um, we can list some like um, actions that can be paid for after the fact. So some things that our group shared were, you know, um, cleaning up the contaminated water that's causing all these birth defects, um, investing in hospital treatments, Another big thing is maybe finishing the cleanup of the actual site where this happened. Um, and as it was mentioned, um, Union Carbide paid $470 million to the Indian government. And this was five years after the tragedy. Um, and this happened after a lot of tension between the Indian government and Union Carbide in the US. Um, this was because you know Union Carbide is a plant in the US, is a company owned in the US, and they kind of put responsibility on the Indian government because they were like, you own stake in this company and this happened in your state. While the Indian government um, refused that responsibility and was like, you know, this is US owned and we don't want to um, take accountability. So it took some time, they had to go to court and this was actually settled for 470 million. Um, some breakdowns of the money. So individuals received 25,000 Indian rupees, which is around 400 <coughs> US dollars. So not every single person affected by this was included. Um, this is protested every year. And a lot of Indian protesters claim that at least half of the funds are unspent still today. Um, and the government paid 1,500 Indian rupees, which translates to $19 for low-income families and only $2.50 for family members that were born before the disaster. So a lot of people do protest that the finance, um, the relief funds were not enough for the long-term effects of this tragedy. And yet to conclude, um, this event is very well known and very well talked about in a lot of like safety conversations. I think it's a good like learning lesson for a lot of companies who choose to um, you know, build plants or build different um, like extensions of their company in outside countries, either to save up on money or to, as we talked about in class, like adhere to more relaxed laws. Um, when you kind of prioritize profit first and put safety on the back burner, a lot of these mistakes kind of pass through and um, it can snowball and these big events happen. Any questions? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a uh, fascinating case study and, you know, where companies do go international like that, there's, <laughs> It's hard for these environmental issues because we can sort of say, like, we're going to do the right thing and make our laws more strict that drives business other places and you know, things like this happen. So it's, it's a tricky situation. Comment? So, with the Indian carbide, like, what, like, I don't understand, like, how the court system works, like, across. Like, Very poorly. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I think there's probably some that happens in India and internationally. Um, it depends case by case. I don't believe we have an international court system. I don't know, I'm not a poly <laughs> by major. So. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it doesn't work well. It's the same with like even if you look at crimes, like smaller crimes, you have the criminal like go somewhere else, it becomes a lot more complicated. Yeah, so Union Carbide was a company in the US. 
and then they extended to India and they called it um, UCIL, so Union Carbide India Incorporated. So it was still owned by Union Carbide, but only like a percentage. And then the other percentage was with the Indian government. And then, so the issue was like, there was responsibility between the two sides, but the issue was that a lot of people were angry that Union Carbide um, did safety measures in their US company, which I think was in like Tennessee or somewhere. Um, but they didn't do the same safety um, protocols in India, which resulted in this um, accident. Great. Yeah, thank you. So group two, St. Francis Dam. Uh, question. So say if we had a, we have a different one uploaded now, because we had to change a little bit of modifications. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I can uh, dig it up. Yeah, I uh, I think I mistakenly had the Dropbox, not a group Dropbox, an individual. Uh, <laughs> Let's see. These are all the same time. Do you know who uploaded the last one? Uh, wait, yeah, wait. Uh, which one is that? Uh, this one? That looks better. Okay. Uh, So uh, our group project was on the St. Francis Dam collapse. Uh, I like that the first group did when we introduced each other, so I'm going to do that too. Uh, my name is Sebastian. I'm Elliot. I'm Deshna. All right, cool. So now I've got that out of the way. Uh, the St. Francis Dam collapse. So for a little uh, background information, this happened in 1928. The dam was built in 1924 to 1926. It was built in a San Francisco. San Francisco Valley, about 40 miles northwest of Los Angeles, and it was built for like a water supply for the Los Angeles aqueduct system. Uh, yeah, and it was designed by William Mulholland, so he's the uh, the main engineer behind this, this project. And that actually goes right into the failures because one of the first main failures with this project is that he was the only uh, oversight for the project. Uh, every, he was in charge of everything, and you know we've seen that happen before. Where that is not uh, that's not how uh, we need we need a, a peer review. So uh, second uh, failure is that he added an extra ten feet twice. That was not accounted for in the plans um, because he wanted the the capacity of the dam to be a little bit more. So that caused structural failure. Um, the dam was also built upon loose bedrock. Uh, the earth was not tested, so once the water filled up the dam, uh, the water saturated the land and caused it to be unstable. And then all the force went to the dam and it broke. So the lessons that we can learn from the San Francisco dam collapse is that the high uplift pressure that can cause a significant breaks to the structural stability of the concrete gravity dam could, you know, potentially lead to the dam failure. So it is crucial to analyze and consider these pressures during the design as well as the evaluation of the dams. The second lesson that we learn is that geologists will have only approved the dam site considering all the reservations, uh, serious reservations, and the knowledge will have used on time to select the dam sites. So they could have raised the concerns and prevent the tragedy. The third lesson is that any modifications um, of the dam, de dam design, especially changes in the height, should be determined carefully. 
We can also see that the long term and short term process of the San Francisco stamp. The long term uh, solutions is that the event drew attention to the importance of the engineering geologic input inside uh, selections, as well as the importance of geological surveys. Uh, invest in the research and development of the advanced construction mater materials that are durable, flexible, as well as resistant to erosion. Um, the short term solutions is that open communication should be done between the engineers as well as the government authorities. And um, dams uh, require the regular inspections as well as that could help uh, detect problems early, allowing time for the repairs. Lastly, we can see that we, uh, we should inform public about ongoing situation evacuation procedures and safety measures uh, through all the various communication challenges and public announcements. One of the main social implications of the dam's collapse is that all the towns in the San Francisco Valley weren't aware of its construction. And so there were a lot of farmers, ranchers, and workers living in the valley and about half of a large portion large portion of them were migrants and transients about half of them mexican and then the collapse of the dam also shook public trust in other dams that mulholland had worked on like in hollywood
and maybe those private individuals would want to help restore historical preservations or also like um, in general just infrastructure projects. So as we all know, tourism is a huge factor into a city, a state, or even like a country as well. And for this dam, if if uh, the reconstruction dam is expected to be a tourist attraction, maybe the revenue from the tourists can be used to uh, offset the cost of the dam. And but overall, now in our present time, it costs about one billion to three billion for a multi-purpose dam, and uh, one billion for a flood uh, control hold structure. So ending this off, yeah, the solutions are indeed expensive, and. I would also like to introduce a map created in ArcGIS Pro. Um, we have the reservoir up there in the dark blue, the flooded area, and the light blue down here. And then the dam is right sort of in the middle um, to the left more. Um, I don't know if you guys can see that, but the dam is right there. And then the reds, all the red lines are the nice lights that happened. Curious, uh, you know how long it took for that, like the actual failure period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, was... so the cracks formed. Like, okay, so, so, so the dude, right? Uh, sorry, this is like it's it's really weird because I don't remember the names. But William Mulholland, right? He had like mm -hmm. a, a watcher who like you know maintained the dam and like watched it and all that. So he was like looking at the dam, and then there was a period of time where like started seeing cracks forming, and he was like. Holland, I need your help. Like, come over here, check it out. And he came over, and he looked at the dam, and he was like, "They're they're just cracks. There's no erosion. It's fine. Everything's fine." And then water started leaking under the dam, and he and the washer was like, "I've never seen this before. What's going on?" And Mulholland, and Mulholland was like, "There's no erosion. It's fine." Right. So a bunch of times, you know, there were a, a ton of like warning signs, and Mulholland just wiped it over, which is another reason why it was like a failure. You know, you shouldn't just have one person charge an entire project, but it took five days. So like once that water started leaking under, you know, there was like a there was an upforce that was not accounted for in the building of the dam because why would the dam be leaking? So you know that caused you know, a ton of pressure, and then within that five day period, the cracks came straight under the under the dam, and then the whole thing just washed away. And I also want to add uh, what was weird about the construction. So because there was a fault, I I don't know if I said this earlier, but there was a fault line that the dam was over, like a deadfall. And the water that was uh, like held by the reservoir, it sort of like went into the land because they didn't have any geologists like checking that or whatever. So it saturated the land, and it seeped into that deadfall, and that's sort of why we had that like undercurrent for the dam. And so both sides of the dam got like pushed apart basically, and all that water was on the way to the dam, and it just collapsed. And so the middle actually stayed standing while the while the two sides got knocked out. Yeah. And from the point of collapse to when the flooding subsided at the ocean, it was about a 12 hour period. Started right before midnight and ended around 5 in the morning when the water reached. So, yeah, yeah, wait. So, the water reached from the dam across that 40 miles all the way to the ocean. That's how, that's how like, that forceful this flood was. It went all the way to the Pacific. And that, that's a about five hours. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> this group three. Great. Pat on this one is a like an A and E is like an F or like uh, not necessarily. Well, so A is uh, the maximum number of points, five points awarded, um, and E is you know one point awarded. Is kind of how the scoring sort of breaks down there. Um, so I guess you could think of it that five would be a A, four would be a B, uh, three would be a C, uh, less than that would be you know D or F. Yeah. Okay, uh, does this look right as far as got the right poster up? Yeah. Uh, let me see, got that. Here. 
So, uh, work or treat. So, I'm Annalise Stroll. Elian. Samuel. So, we're going to open with a bit of background information about Van Port. So, uh, the city of Van Port, which is a combination of Vancouver and Portland, was the nation's largest public housing project at the time of over just over about 600 acres or so. Uh, it was proposed in 1942 by Henry Kaiser as a solution to wartime housing for his Portland area shipyards, which attracted people from across the country for work during the early years of World War II. So he acquired land uh, in a floodplain to develop with the intention of creating temporary housing for its workers. So the city of Danforth was finished roughly a year later and was very quickly built with poor construction and inadequate materials used to save costs. So there was like wooden foundations, for example. And even after the war, the infrastructure was never improved despite the people still living there. So on May 30th, 1948, at roughly 4.17 p.m., after weeks of heavy rain and snow melt in the mountains, the Columbia River flooded in the gold mine community. It breached the Northern Pacific Railroad embankment, and 18,500 residents were affected. They only had 30 minutes to evacuate. There were 15 deaths. Uh, I'll be talking about the social racial medical issues. Um, the poorest population was growing rapidly due to the uh, shipyard workers, and in addition to that, uh, Portland restricted African American uh, families from living in many parts of Portland, and uh, Vanport was built to accommodate to that. And after the war, most people stayed in Vanport, even though it was uh, originally meant to be a temporary. And then in 1948, the flood happened and uh, turned many people homeless, including a third of uh, African American families. And after that, uh, Portland came into action and took responsibility to uh, provide housing and uh, food as well. And uh, however, discrimination was still there, and it was a big issue in Portland. And uh, the flood kind of, in a way, uh, forced Portland to acknowledge that. And after that, uh, Portland's population grew significantly. Okay, uh, regarding financial solutions or theoretical financial solutions, because they didn't do anything um, for Van Port. They kind of gave up on it and evacuated the residents. Um, we had $21,500,000 in property damage. Um, there is the uh, West End Railroad embankment that served as flood protection that ultimately broke. Um, so that, for reference, is 125 feet, or 0 0.038 kilometers. Um, so we have two options that could have been done. Uh, a new river dike or levi system, uh, or a flood wall, which is a foundation made from steel or concrete, has better stability. Uh, kind of playing part to the uh, racial discrimination aspect, they didn't really care to implement these options. However, if they did, just for the west end portion that broke to replace it, uh, not the other portions, it would have been, in today's standards, 12.1 million, 18.2 million per kilometer for a new river dike system, or 31 million per kilometer for like a uh, key wall, sort of flood wall, uh, which is stronger and prevents like permeation, which is what happened, like inner erosion. Um, they clearly didn't care to uh, implement these stronger sorts of protections, and they relied on an existing railroad fill, which was pretty ineffective. Um, they being the USACE, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, um, it was pretty inadequate, and no one cared to implement these options. Um, oh, for that, which was 31 million per kilometer, since it was only 25, 125 feet, for the West End portion, it would have been 1,178,000 just for that portion uh, on the West End, and they clearly, clearly didn't care to do that. Um, who should pay, uh, or who should have paid? The HAP, Housing Authority of Portland, since Vanport was outside of uh, city limits, HAP was like an unofficial city government. Uh, they really didn't care about uh, doing that. or. City of Portland could have helped fund that 
um, or just federal funds, which is how Vanport kind of came to be in the first place. They could have pitched that as like a more adequate sort of flood protection, uh, but they didn't. So it's theoretical. Um, lessons learned. There should be adequate flood control infrastructure built prior to the housing projects opening. Obviously, we should, as engineers, we should have made sure it was safe and habitable for residents to live there. Although it was temporary, we more than half of the people after the war ended stayed there and lived there. So there was not um, good maintenance and renovations made to make sure that it's actually safe to still live in. There obviously wasn't any, uh, I guess, safety protocols or evacuation plans for people who live in this low lying community. So, like, you go to the beach and stuff, there's always these signs of tsunami warning and things like that, evacuation routes, and they weren't warned, obviously, of this. Open foundations would have been better. So, they use wooden foundations, as Emily said, and in a swampy area like this, it's obviously <laughs> uh, because of natural. It's more, it can get moldy, break down easily. So when the flood came in, all their apartments and housing projects kind of just floated away in less than an hour. Um, yeah, we should have. The railroad obviously erosion underneath. That's why it kind of the flood built through it. And I think that maybe because of the initial integration. I think that despite um, any biases we may have, they had been, the civil engineers had a duty to protect the residents that were living there. And Henry Kaiser, who was a rich industrialist, is the one who built the city because the housing authority of Portland did not want to build any new houses for the influx of workers that were coming from around the world to work in the shipyards. Um, so I feel like. They left families <coughs> on their own, kind of, and the city didn't make sure that it was a safe place to live. I'm, I'm curious, uh, <laughs> sorry, um, do you know how much the water level rose? Oh, it's feet, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. With the, the and the yeah. Bonneville Dam had already been constructed, I guess. The so what? The Bonneville Dam? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just kind of curious uh, uh, what the current situation as far as any sort of levy support or anything in that area. It's a park now. Yeah, it's West Delta Park. Delta Park. So like the Portland Raceway and like Hare and Golf Course. Uh -huh. that's, that's where it is now. Just gave up. So there's not necessarily per se, if, if we had 15 feet of of, of water rise, we'd have a, a similar flood. I feel like they have probably built in better flood control infrastructure, so they probably made levees, better dikes, had appropriate maintenance to make sure it isn't like this wouldn't happen again. And now we have, I guess, to raise a, a park there. People can go there now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody know other history about Vanport? Yes, you. Predecessor. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So there was like a small school or something here in Vanport that became what is PSU. It was relocated from uh, Vanport because of the flood downtown. And then that became Portland State as it grew and got more funding and stuff. We have a hall yeah, and Smith, I know there's the Vanport room. Is there a, is there a van? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Cool. All right. Kapoor.
So hello everyone. We did our group. We did our poster on the Love Canal disaster that occurred in 1978. So we'll just introduce ourselves as well. My name is Iman, and I'll be talking about the ethical responsibilities. Um, I'm Hassan. I'm going to be covering the lessons learned and solutions. I'm Yuri. I'm going to be covering half of what happened. I'm Sean. I'm going to be covering the last half of what happened. My name is Zayed. I'll be doing social social. Love Canal was located in Niagara Falls, New York. It is a part of women's vision to provide hydroelectric power for people living in the area. That was cut short with the invention of alternating currents. And in the 1930s, the canal contained water and so people used it for recreational purposes of swimming in the summer and ice skating in the winter. This continued for several, several years until 1942 when the Hoover Electric Company, Natalie and Austin, started acquiring land. For the next 11 years, they would use Love Canal as a hazard to use All right, so uh, for the first point, the 21,000 tons of chemicals, uh, along with what she was saying, it was a swim hole and it, it was used for recreational purposes. This, of course, went into play after the termination of the power canal, uh, or, yeah, uh, the power canal. Uh, it did last from 1942 to 1953. Uh, from this point, Hooker, the company, uh, disposed of their leftover industrial hazardous waste, and uh, the city of Niagara Falls also disposed their municipal waste. Uh, the type of waste that the company put into the canal uh, consisted of, like, Caustics, alkaline, fatty acids, and uh, chlorinated uh, hydrocarbons. And uh, these had came from the dyed perfumes and solvents from the rubber and synthetic resins. And a uh, fact upon this is that uh, the chemicals were buried 20 to 25 feet. And some of the wastes that the city of Niagara Falls disposed, those were like, you know, regular type garbage, you know, it could have been durable goods like tires and furniture and uh, also non-durable goods like uh, plastic plates and newspapers. So to go along and continue to the second point, landfill covered and sold. Uh, when Niagara Falls ended their disposal of reuse, Hooker became the owner of the site and they then filled the site with soil. When they filled it with soil, Vegetation had grew over the whole site, and at the time of the closure of the dump site, the city of Niagara Falls entered economic expansion and rapid population growth, and a uh, school that was being planned to be built, they wanted to build their school on the Love Canal's land, so they also wanted to build houses. Because of this, they had asked the Love Canal company about like building it on it, and the company mentioned to them, they were saying how they did have, they made them aware of the chemicals that were, that were disposed in there. And the school, like, refused. They didn't care at all. They just, they wanted to build a school on the land. So what the company did is they just, they said, because you're aware, you know, we're just going to sell the land for a dollar. Uh, it's crazy. It's a dollar for a whole piece of land. But the school ended up paying a dollar. They did build a school and they built, um, a lot of houses and, to continue along to the third point, a thousand miles of heavy rainfall. Heavy rainfall had occurred after the construction of everything, and because of the rainfall of the soil, uh, it uplifted chemicals from what was disposed, and people started to uh, inhale those chemicals. And there was there was effects like abnormalities and like birth effects. Uh, because of this, investigation was done and. The people that were getting in inhale, those people ended up getting assistance, uh, and also the city of Niagara Falls was getting assistance. They ended up protesting, and yeah, 
you know, them getting assistance, it wasn't, they wouldn't have got assistance without the protest. So, so for the lessons learned and solutions, the first uh, lesson learned is the importance of properly disposing hazardous waste. So, the, neg the negligent disposal of these hazardous wastes was um, caused a lot of widespread uh, health issues. Um, some of them are uh, have birth defects and cancers among the residents. Uh, this incident served as a reminder of the devastating consequences of improper waste disposal. Um, it showed the need for the disposal of hazardous waste regulations to be more strict and monitored more cl uh, closely and uh, responsible uh, corporate practices and community awareness to prevent similar disasters and protect the public health. For the second point, it's the importance of continuous monitoring. So this disaster highlighted the need for ongoing uh, vigilant monitoring of hazardous waste, uh, hazardous waste sites to, to detect and uh, address environmental hazards before they escalate. Uh, continuous monitoring is essential to ensure the safety of, com of communities and to prevent long-term uh, environmental damage. It serves as a vital tool in identifying potential risks and enables, enables time, timely responses to protect public health and the environment, emphasizing the importance of regu regulatory uh, oversight and corporate res responsibility in managing uh, such sites effectively. For the uh, last point, uh, it's the raised awareness to health impacts. So this crisis saved, served as a wake-up call, um, highlighting the need for public awareness and regulatory measures related to the dangers of toxic waste. Uh, it encouraged not only the affected community but the nation, but the nation to recognize the long-term health consequences uh, associated with the, with the environmental contamination. The Love Canal disaster gave us a, broad, a broader understanding of the importance of health assessment and risk manage, management in environmental uh, decision making. Uh, it left a, la a lasting legacy in the public health and environmental policy. All right, so for the social and racial experiences, uh, what I got was my studies was that Love Canal <coughs> affected all social and racial groups evenly, but instead it impacted certain groups, including low income blue collar workers that live near the toxic waste site with their families. Now you may be asking me, why were these people affected the most? But one of the reasons why I just limited resources to uh, relocate when there was toxic waste being inside their house. Um, and also, it also was also uh, due to the uh, financial issues to try, uh, for them trying to move, rent, or buy to be a crucial financial burden for these families until August 7th when President Carter declared emergency evacuation. Um, another reason why was limited uh, access to health care. The residents who experienced exposure to the toxic waste uh, didn't get the right treatment right away, leading, and as a negative result of this was uh, the miscarriage rates in the Love Canal went up by 300%. Uh, and the children that did live from the miscarriages uh, they had various health conditions, including wet feet, three rows of teeth, deafness, blindness, and damage to their kidneys and lungs. It was also found that 97% of the residents had traces of one, two, and four of tri uh, bands in their blood, causing cancer and making it difficult for their bodies to mount to any immune defense of death. And so when it comes to these types of disasters, it's important to look at the ethical aspects and to see what we can do to prevent these disasters from occurring again in modern day. And so here are a few points that we should consider to ensure the safety of society and the environment. So the first point is disposal of chemicals. And so laboratories and facilities that are known to use chemicals should definitely have set procedures and regulations on how to dispose chemicals that are known to be toxic to the environment and uh, society. And so the second point would be the land surveying standards. There should be higher and strict safety, safety standards for land surveying to help determine if the land is capable of having facilities being built on in order to ensure that the environment and society remains unharmed. And so then the third point is monitoring land health. There needs to be strict and high standards to help deem if the land is capable of being used for the public. And there should also be strict monitoring in order to see any impacts that is happening on the land 
over time. And then the fourth point would be training for staff. And so companies should definitely inc incorporate detailed training on how to dispose these chemicals. And then the last point would be strict punishments. We should make the government hold these companies accountable and impose hefty and strict punishments for violating health and safety regulations. And so thank you all for listening to our presentation. <laughs> So nothing's free in life, right? Someone's trying to sell you a piece of property for a dollar. You gotta think. It's really worth it. Uh oh, it's tracking it. Let it over here. Let's see here. It's okay. Oh, it's doing it again. Here we go. Got it. Turn it off. Also, the sidewalk. Yes. So there's supposed to be like a hearing aid. This looks on there. So mm -hmm. that Okay. 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 Hi everyone. I'm Laura. Um, this is Joshua, Alan, and Giselle. Uh, our group chose to do research on the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So I'm pretty much going to go over just high level stuff, what happened, um, some of the engineering issues, and um, yeah, just some of the impacts on that. And then we'll move on to solutions and go on from there. Um, OK, so what happened? So in 2010, off the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the Deepwater Horizon oil drilling rig exploded and then sank in the course of two days. Um, so it was currently owned by TransOcean and then leased out by BP. So due to this, 11 workers died and is currently the largest spill in the history of marine oil drilling operations um, of its kind. Um, over the course of I think I had it, 87 days, uh, 4 million barrels of oil flowed out into the ocean. Uh, it killed 11 workers. Oh, I think I said that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it spilled out over 87 days before it, it was finally capped. Okay. So some of the contributing factors that led to the explosion and the oil leak were that, so BP had contracted out, um, for a company to come and install a concrete core to seal an oil well for later use. Uh, in which they used nitrogen to accelerate the curing of the um, cement. And this actually led to the core uh, being weak, and so it couldn't withstand the pressure. So by this, the gas and oil was able to actually get through the uh, pipe or the tube um, up to the platform. And so that's why it made its way up and then ignited. Um, so then... Okay, so then the BOP, the blow-up preventer, was designed to close the channel, but this also malfunctioned, and this is where BP had tried to activate it, but due to a faulty battery and switch, um, it didn't actually work. So the way, or so one of the main components of the BOP um, were a set of these blind shear rams that were designed to cut through the pipe so that it stops the oil from making its way up to the top. And um, through the research, it was found that these malfunctioned because the pipe had bent under pressure. Um, oh, yeah, that's up there. Okay, so basically these were the main issues that led to the explosion and then the leak. Um, and then, so I'm going to lead it or give it on to 
Joshua to kind of continue on to the solutions or possible solutions. Um, I'm going to go briefly over a bit more of the problems. Uh, starting by saying that the, there was negligence from every party involved, including British Petroleum, which is BP. Um, they were two weeks behind schedule and they wanted to move the deep water horizon onto like a new project. So they used the nitrogen to cure the cement faster. And so they tried to speed things up. Um, the crew was also negligent because they, uh, the deep water horizon currently had a completely clean track record. So no injuries or accidents have been reported up to this point. Uh, and actually one of the funny thing is they, um, shut off the gas alarm because they tried or the purpose of that was to avoid being woken up by false alarms so really they just got too comfortable and um <coughs> kind of they contributed to this uh, catastrophe uh let's see okay so cbs or the chemical safety and Hazard Investigation Board uh, noted two instances of miswiring and two instances of battery failures within the BOP. Like uh, it was, the blind shear ram had a yellow pod and a blue pod that had emergency systems that would activate in the case that the platform or the rig on the top could not be manually activated. Uh, but somehow, I'm not uh, an expert on electrical systems, but since both batteries failed, apparently it, they, it, that canceled it out and it did activate, but like it, um, like we said, it, the blind CRM still couldn't seal the well because uh, the, the pipe that led to the rig was bent under effective pressure. This was uh, a CBS, or CSB rather said this was caused by minuscule like differences in surface area on the sides of the pipe so like there was a side of the pipe that had a minuscule amount more surface area which allowed that the pipe to be bent in that direction and so the blind shear rim could not close it uh so two solutions obviously the first one was to the first one being following uh safety protocols and not turning off the gas alarm and uh not being like ne negligent, obviously. Uh, the other thing was avoid using nitrogen or uh, to try to cure the cement faster, let, do, uh, let, let it take its time. Or maybe find another chemical that would not weaken the cement core that ended up being a major part of the problem. And then uh, the blind shear ram, uh, like I said, was pa powered by batteries. So maybe have it uh, powered mainly by more hydraulic systems or high pressurized liquids which is actually what uh, more modern uh, BOPs are um, built with. So let's, I think that's it for me. I'm going to pass it on to Alan. All right, so social and economic impact. Uh, so the majority of like health uh, issues that came from this came from like the respondents to it, like the Coast Guard and the oil cleanup workers. Um, like the USGC the US Coast Guard studies and also gold studies showed that uh, there was a positive association between the workers and uh, suffering like, acute respiration, uh, respiratory, eye, skin, um, and uh, neurological uh, disorders like headaches, uh, reduced lung function, things like that. Uh, there's also a lot of like less like info on like uh, the general public like on the mainland because the, generally the studies were slow to implement and also just like lacked uh, or they didn't like test for a lot of things like PAH, -A -A which is like polyaromatic aromatic hydrocarbons. So a lot of it was also outdated too. Uh, but what was studied well was the economic impact, which saw about $2.3 billion lost in the fishing industry, which is the hardest, especially in like, uh, like uh, states with strong like, fishing economy like Louisiana. Uh, so about two point, uh, both commercial and recreation saw about like 1.2 billion lost, and then like also like state taxes lost about 360 million, things like that, and about 25,000 fishing jobs were lost. Also related, there was a moratorium on offshore drilling, which also hurt Louisiana because another one of its major industries was uh, oil. So another 8,000 to 12,000 jobs were lost. And uh, so Louisiana was the hardest, but the thing was that BP mostly studied the what happened in America. The people who actually hurt the most was arguably Mexico, and especially like the <coughs> community Saladero, which was 
uh, because they weren't getting studied a lot, they weren't given priority in any like the cleanups. So what they used to try to uh, stop the spread of like the surface level oil was something called core corexic, which is a dispersant, which instead of letting the oil like uh, spread out, it had the oil sink, which killed the oil, like scared away most fish. So Salazero, which had like about 10,000 like, uh, like pounds of fish that they caught every year, was like experienced in 2020, like about like, 1,000. And uh, what happened was Mexico didn't fight too hard about it because BP was also like starting to add more like uh, their sites in Mexico. So they kind of settled like uh, just $25 million. Uh, yeah, that's about it. So for the finances for Deepwater Horizon, it's pretty much a mess. The settlement procedure, it was just really messy. They were all blaming each other and just practically <coughs> suing each other for like millions of dollars, blaming each one for it. And in the end, he was the one who had to technically take all the responsibility over the issue, but all the other companies also ended up taking a lot of blame. As for the settlement, they agreed to settle on $2.8 billion, which is the largest environmental damage in U.S. history. And all of the funds had to go into organizations with the U.S. and a lot of programs to just help clean the whole mess that they had done. And 35% of the 35% of all of that went to restore economic improvement, 30% to restore and protect the Gulf Coast, 30% to plan and improve state processing programs, 2.5% went to the NOAA, which is also known as the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, and 2.5% went to the NOAA for a long term priority, but 2.5% to non governmental organizations. And the remaining of the 20.7% 20 20 went to the oil spill removal. And overall, as of now, over the past 10 decades or the 10 years, uh, it is recorded to have BP spent over $71 billion. Um, and then I guess lastly, in terms of some of the ethical implications or responsibilities, um, around this topic. Um, so President Obama actually enlisted the Deepwater Horizon Oil Spill and Offshore Drilling Commission, um, as well as there were like other independent study groups that all concluded to the same failures ethically and I mean, as well as the engineering um, issues. But so overall, it would appear BP overlooked safety to cut costs and save time, um, leading to mismanagement. And if you look back, it actually wasn't their first offense. So they had used the liquid nitrogen in the past in another issue or um, same type of situation where it um, also ended up not so well for them. Um, so I think in terms of engineering, um, I feel like it's our duty as humans, not just humans, but engineers to not just study or be trained technically with you know, these types of issues and how to avoid these issues technically, but to kind of be trained in a broader way of thinking to kind of question what the thinking is behind what went wrong and not just the mathematical data that, you know, on paper, if, you know, this goes past a certain number of pressure, whatever, this is what could happen. So I think, you know, moving forward, it's our duty as, you know, in this field to study these things in terms of more of like that humanitarian side of things versus just the technical stuff, you know, because we're all trained to be like problem solvers, right? But yeah, generally I feel like that would be a great way to move forward, especially since we're the ones that exploit these natural, you know, resources of this earth, right? So it's, it's our duty to, I think, kind of go deeper into that. But I think that's all we have. Anyone have any questions? Thank you. Yeah, it's a depressing topic. Lots of damage. That's good. Keep it, everyone. Is there a way to move through slides?
Uh, yeah, so if you go, let's see here. How can I do this? Here, maybe I'll just keep it this way and someone could just like get the, the arrow over. Yeah? Okay. All right, so we'll do one more group and then we'll take a break. So this is a uh, group six. <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, we're in team six. I'm Jock Sean. Uh, I'm Isaiah. I'm Molly. I'm Molly. I'm Lauren. I'm Lauren. Um, and we'll be presenting the Ohio train derailments. Okay, so what went wrong? On February 3rd, 2023, a train in Ohio derailed, which caused a fire and chemical spills. Um, the the train carried hazardous materials in five trains, five train cars such as vinyl chloride, 115 gallons of vinyl chloride. So what vinyl chloride can do, it increases the risk of cancer and increases the risk of death. Um, so not only that, but it caused pollution into the air and rivers, and it polluted the air to the point where a lot of residents, nearby residents got sick and had to move away, and it polluted rivers to the point where many fish became sick and over 3,500 fish died. Um, so how did this happen? Before the accident happened, the engineer decided to ignore signs of danger, such as the overheating of bearings. Um, so the engineer noticed first couple signs of just overheating. He just kind of went along with it at the point he wanted to stop it, but it didn't work and the train derailed. And towards like the end of this, after all of this, many people just blame the engineer for not having stopped sooner. So the first failure of um, this case was the engineer who had ignored all the warning signs. Um, and within that time, because um, they ignored the um, warning signs, there were, um, it was reported that the wheels, wheel uh, bearings got up to 253 degrees hotter than air. And the company um, Southern Norfolk's policy, they were at 170 degrees. The uh, engineer was supposed to stop the train. But because they didn't do that, um, sparks were seen uh, an hour before the car. Um, train cars uh, derailed and which dragged along other cars, causing um, a massive spill. So, uh, I have a social and racial implication. And uh, uh, a lot of people have been evacuated due to obvious hazards for, uh, for the locals. The derailment caused obvious health concerns for the people, uh, and some individuals even reported uh, health symptoms. Um, in, one of, in one of the lawsuits, uh, I think the company responsible was also uh, made to pay for pay for uh, all this uh, health screenings and uh, uh, for treatment for people 30, 30 mile radius uh, from the from the spill. The spill had potential to affect the local ecosystems and aquatic life by contaminating the waterways and soil. Some animals in the area became ill or died, possibly as a result of the incident. Um, although people have been affected, similarly, people closer to the spill uh, likely been affected more than people than not. Well, so, what's our ethical responsibility as a society when a problem like the train? the high train burns occurred. Well, as a society, we have a significant responsibility when it comes to improving the system that's contributed to the problem, like the high train derailment, uh, to minimize the occurrence. So some of these responsibilities include. Uh, the first one would be safety regulations and uh, enforcement safety. Uh, society should uh, advocate for and, uh, and demand safety regulations uh, regard, uh, re yeah. 
governing training operations and transportation infrastructures. Uh, regulatory ag uh, agencies must ensure that these rules are uh, effectively, effectively enforced. Uh, secondly, the infrastructure maintenance, proper maintenance of the runway, uh, tra uh, tracks, bridges, signals, and other infrastructure components is necessary. Society should support investment in the infrastructure upkeep to prevent accident for uh, structure. Uh, there will be a continuous improvement. Society has a responsibility to support uh, a culture of continuous impro uh, improvement uh, within the railway industry. This means uh, encouraging uh, companies to learn from accidents near, miss uh, near misses, implement necessary changes, and share uh, best practices. Finally, we have like, improvements over emergency response. Work, work, uh, when working with your, uh, specialized people, professionals in hazard roles, Materials and emergency responders to minimize the response between uh, the events and the source. And short term solutions, the EPA, also known as the Environmental Protection Agency, had ordered the company Norfolk Southern to identify any contaminated soil and water. Um, they, sh they should also be reimbursed for cleaning at um, homes and businesses. For, and then the company should also attend meetings, and if any of those actions were um, weren't met, they would be charged like triple the cost of what um, the EPA had charged um, the company. And in long terms, um, Norfolk should pay its residents for um, they should pay for their property values and medical money from possible cancer treatments and other health um, concerns. So cleanup is still ongoing and litigation will probably be going on over this. So we have some real numbers and some pro proposed solutions we thought that Norfolk Southern should uh, handle. And so uh, money-wise, looking at 2022, the gross profits for Norfolk Southern and Union Pacific, is another railway that uh, transport hazardous chemicals and tankers, uh, was $8 billion and $14 billion respectively. Um, their net profits, net profits were 3.26 billion and 9 billion or 6.9 billion. So um, they got a lot of money. Um, also, one of the things that was implemented after a train disaster in 2013 was they design, designed a better tanker with like thicker metal so that this incident might not happen in the future. It's called the DOT 117. It's approximately $160,000 to build a new tank uh, to that specification. And um, Hopefully, you know, we would think that, um, so like hazardous chemicals, when they're transported, they're class one through nine, and this was like a higher class hazardous material. So maybe like we could say like, hey, you have until 20, right now they have until 2025 to switch to this tanker, but we could say, oh, just kidding, for like hazardous material class five and up, you need to get on this tank like immediately to prevent another incident. Um, and currently the cleanup cost is at 830 million, but they're not done, so who knows what that'll get to. Uh, one solution we thought of was when you're tra when a company's transporting like a highly hazardous material, they might just put down a deposit. That way, in case anything happens, they can immediately turn over money to the EPA or have their own people, like the response team, ready to roll. Um, and that they should pay for yearly cancer screenings and any oncology necessary for people within a radius. Uh, and we can get a number for that because you know, like cancer treatment in the United States is crazy and it differs from hospital to hospital, but we just think they should have a blank check ready to go for these people. Uh, and then offer the fair market value plus 20% for the homes of people in this affected area. Uh, that's about $180,000. The average home or the median home price there is $145,000. So it'd be about there. And then people could petition if they thought they had a nicer house. Yeah, money. Any Uh, the vinyl chloride was it? Um, why was it being canceled? Was it going to like disposal? Was it going to a plant to be used? Like, I think I heard it was going to be made into PVC to so be used. Okay, so it's going to be back to the Other questions? Alright, thank you. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break. What's uh, 11.40? So come back 11.50 ish. 
Yes. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. So this is busy week with this presentation and your paper. So there's no writing up with this week. Maybe relax on that. Um, okay. So yeah, 1150 each plus or minus. Come back. We'll get started with next group. Question for you. Sure. Totally fine if not. Um, but my dad came to visit from like the coast. Um, and I was wondering if I could leave once my group finishes. It's totally fine if not. It's just like the presentations have been running long and I have another class after this. So I just wanted like a little extra time to see him. Mm -hmm. um, but if you'd rather I stay and finish grading, that's also fine. I still have some time after this class. Um, I don't know. That, I, I don't know that that's in my uh, my realm to say yay or nay. Um, you know, I don't know your personal situation. And, you know, that's true. All that kind of stuff. So uh, I just didn't want to leave and like leave the rest of my page blank. You know, so right. I mean, you don't have to hand hand it in now. You oh, that's true. Can I watch the? Um... Uh, you could watch the video and hand it in later. Okay. Yeah, um, I can so do that. That's also fine. Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just a quick question about the, the research paper. Yes. So, do you want me to buy preferably the Do you have like a range of what you want? Well, so you've got like the sections, right? You got like background information, background information, you know. You don't have to summarize everything. Go summarize like some of the uh, critical uh, points. So that'll be like a couple, a couple paragraphs. Then you got the assessment, and that's kind of typically kind of the paragraph. So very big, you know, big, big. In my opinion, has a lot of responsibility. So that's either a long paragraph or maybe like break it into a couple paragraphs. You know, I know like the questions, the breakout questions, there are a couple of questions that are all big. Engineers, mm -hmm. but I'll answer those you know, on there. Like whether they should continue. Mm -hmm. Why they? Yeah. Why. But so, you know, so so big's kind of a big one. But then I also want you to think about like well, what about the contract? You know, what about you know, the DOT and stuff? And so uh, you know those uh, components might be shorter paragraphs, but you still should touch upon them. Um, and so I, I think just. Uh, Kind of touch upon all these uh, uh, responsible parties, and then sort of summarize at the end. Yeah, it's probably okay. you know plus or minus three pages. Um, uh, if uh, depending on how much you throw in the background and how much you sort of support, like yeah, you know, they fix it fall because of X Y Z, and you add in a lot of supporting information that might make it a little bit longer. You know, but if you find your Five pages, that's probably longer than yeah, that's not it. my intent. Since I said everyone was at fault, that was kind of like my PA. How like everyone has a fault in the whole project, mm -hmm. like in the paragraphs. Then I said, like, their responsibility, how they were at fault, and like why. I need like a new source article to back it up. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. That's about like, I'm just starting to talk about like writing, I'm like typing my first paragraph to like an engineer. Mm -hmm. I already read the introduction and the, the background to the collapse, and that's like, I have like two, two little over. Yeah, like, I'm on the second page, so mm -hmm. it's like, I have like three pages. Still like down. I mean, I think that uh, three pages is probably uh, you can address all the topics. Um, but, you know, I, I guess my filter and how I kind of look at it is. You know, go ahead and get through your draft and then you know look at uh, that sort of guide as far as like okay so let's talk about fitting have a talk about fitting and then sort of look at that critically and think like oh did I really kind of address and say what I want to say and then okay, let's talk about the contractor let's talk about the contractor that kind of you know complete and sort of observe so 
you know, once you kind of get through it, kind of critically go back at it, and, and don't just really, you know, get through it uh, the first draft and be like, oh yeah, looks three plays is fine. Yeah. You know, you kind of want to do that sort of every more regular just kind of view. So for each of the paragraphs, so like the engineer and the farm transportation, can I like include, like I know I talked about it today, about like questions about like how they continue or how their job, like from all those questions, kind of like, kind of take it, like add it into each contractor, the inspector, and engineer. Sure. To, like answer Good. those questions. You could, like, yeah. Like a provider. Sure. That's, that's one way to handle it, yeah. So basically just from background information, the plant was, so it's a nuclear plant. The plant was first commissioned in 1971. And at the time, it, it consists of six boiling uh, water reactors. And at the time it was the biggest, one of the 15 largest plants in the world. Um, it was also the first plant to be designed and constructed and run in conjunction with the General Electric, Electric Company and the Tokyo Electric Power Company. So uh, what happened is that it occurred, the accident occurred on March 11, 2011 in Japan in the Fukushima Prefecture. Um, 
an earthquake with a 9.1 magnitude erupted in the Pacific Ocean, and it caused a 14 meter tsunami. Um, the, this led to a series of meltdowns, uh, hydrogen explosions, and the release of radioactive materials into the surrounding environment. So basically, because of the tsunami, the power went out and it flooded all of the backup generators. So um, here is a visual of the plant. So um, here, this is the emergency diesel generator, the batteries, it flooded all of that. Um, another thing to point out is that the plant itself was only designed to withstand uh, 5.7 uh, high waves of the tsunami, but the tsunami itself was 14 meters. So um, because of the power running out, the cooling systems failed in three of the six reactors that were present in the plant. So it was reactors one, two, and three, as you can see in the picture above. Um, because of the cooling systems failing, the uh, plants had rising heat within them, within the each reactor, and that caused the fuel rods in the reactors to melt down. So the fuel rods were mostly made of steel, and so the steel melted and fell right through. Um, this is a picture of the reactor building. The reactor is in the middle, um, and then there is a containment vessel that contains the nuclear power inside. So as the melted material fell down to the bottom, um, it punctured through right uh, through the bottom of the reactor containment <coughs> vessel. And then the containment vessel, actually the bottom of it is consisted about eight inches of thick steel. So it melted right through that. Um, and that caused sort of like a dripping action down here, which was just a volcano that was waiting to erupt. So um, as the rising heat and the high pressure, it erupted over the course of three weeks the three reactors um, had explosions, and then that released nuclear material and radioactive energy throughout the plant. Okay, and now we're going to move on to our demonstration applications. The first thing is that the people that live near the accident faced more issues than the people that live far away. They were exposed to like, radiation, and exposure and like that leads them to like health problems and then for like the social part of the community they all face a bunch of like terrible stuff such as the aftermath of the disaster of the catastrophe income individuals and families often face like great challenges in evacuating and medical attention they lack the financial resources and support networks to require them to cope with the crisis. And other vulnerable groups are the elders. The elderly, due to the health condition and reduced mobility, were the most vulnerable to the effects of the nuclear accident. They often struggle to evacuate and obtain necessary medical care, making them negatively impacted. Then we're going to move on to children and pregnant women. Children and pregnant women are particularly sensitive to radiation exposure. The long-term impact of the nuclear accident on their well-being was a scientific concern. They faced higher risks of developing radiation-related health issues and birth defects. These social and, and racial implications highlight the importance of addressing this, the, this the disaster in responding and recovery efforts. It is initial to consider the unique needs of vulnerable groups to ensure that future responses to such events are more like dealt with better. And all of these people that were like living near the location of where it's happening, like had their homes like they couldn't live in them anymore because they were just like completely ruined. And they couldn't like move out because they were poor, and it would be mostly people that were living in farms that weren't able to live because all of the food was like contaminated by the accident and all of that. So it was pretty hard for them to live. But people that had more money, had more like better social class, they would live more comfortable because they could have the opportunity to get like. Health, like like medication and these kinds of stuff that they can 
work and like even information. So the people that live near the accident didn't have literally any information about how to survive through this. It was mostly just the people with power. So I'm gonna touch on the ways that we could have prevented it and lessons learned from this incident specifically. I think it's really important for a lot of these engineering failures to keep in mind that hindsight is 2020. So in the moment they didn't have all of the information that we have now for what the event itself specifically was. The tsunami itself that hit this section was I think that's third largest in history from like that we have on record and specifically was the largest to have hit Japan itself. So one of the main things, one of the first things was having more emergency procedures in place, having better communication throughout the entire staff and whatnot, training for emergency evacuations, having drills for that type of thing. Like previously presented as well, the seawall was only rated for waves reaching 5.7 meters when the waves that hit the plant itself were up to 14 to 15 meters high. Having a higher seawall for that would have prevented a lot of damages. Also having redundant backup power, because all they had here for this was an emergency diesel generator for backup and some batteries. Having more redundant backup power would have possibly prevented that meltdown itself from occurring after the event. And one of the major things would be to elevate, remove cooling systems and key elements for safety from being just at or right above sea level. That definitely did not help with the meltdown itself. There are a lot of extra things that were stated for what could have been done, such as having some form of passive cooling rather than just the active cooling that needed to be powered, doing regular stress tests for the reactor itself to see if it could handle the impact of the tsunami itself, having in place more evacuation procedures for the general populace in the area, and having more international collaboration for support in that time. Yeah. Uh, another fun fact, well not really fun, but fun um, uh, till this day they are producing large amounts and gallons and gallons of radioactive water that is contaminated because it flooded the reactor buildings. So till 2023, um, the plant is producing large amounts of contaminated water that is unsafe. And they are trying to fix that today by freezing the water in order to keep it at bay. So. Another fun, not so fun fact. Uh, this, the tsunami itself was regarded to be the most expensive natural disaster that we have on record, costing Japan itself two, $220 billion US dollars. Any questions? I have another fun fact. I was in their station. I was in the <laughs> Navy. I fell, I, was, I fell asleep with that whole thing. I woke up the next day, found out there was an earthquake, and all the oh. pregnant ladies from there told me now Japan was like, yeah. Oh, right. Interesting. I, fell, I thought it was a nightmare. I woke up the next day. I was like, yeah. TV was moving. I was like, did that really happen? And, but yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I just have a question about the disaster. So a nine point one earthquake, that's like really crazy. Like right? Magnitude ten, I wanna say. Like you can expect to happen, I guess. So uh, nuclear power plants like near building buildings are they're not built in the same like that big, but Well so it didn't fail because of the earthquake. And Japan actually for seismic design is one of the leading countries in the world as far as this technology that they utilize and they're investing in that. And so it withstood the earthquake shake is fine. They have a major precedent for earthquakes the in Japan. Flooding. So. Yeah, the flooding but, but it was just the flooding. The, the earthquake occurred in the ocean. I think it took 30 minutes and for so the wave to reach. This big tidal wave that was 17 meters that came ashore. And so it was the water flooding up there. 
<clears throat> but given like how closely it's the water doing so much you can do and like evacuation plans and stuff. I know about that the tsunami would be like that big. I don't it's, know if it's mm -hmm. I mean Japan is crowded. They are. They have a historic precedent for earthquakes in Japan, but this one was the largest that they had ever received. That they had on record at the time. Question. The the incident itself, I think it was somewhere in the hundreds of thousands, and then there is still impact from the nuclear fallout to this day. It, Reached it reached U.S. soil, so it, I mean, it was. Nobody lives around there anymore. Yeah. They don't really operate it anymore. They're trying to go in um, to obviously like keep the radioactive energy at bay, but it's to this day it's very dangerous. So. Uh, I just have something to add. I was in the Navy and I worked on the nuclear reactors on the aircraft carrier, and the way we do it in there, and like the U.S. Navy is the only program in the world that hasn't had a nuclear accident. Um, is you make it so that there's a natural circulation between a body of cold water like the ocean, like they were in there, and you make it so that um, you have lots of backup generators to cool pumps, but in the worst case scenario, there's like no way to isolate it from the cold body of water so that when that hot water will circulate it through to keep it cooling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, roughly around this time frame, the building code that we have in the U.S. had a new chapter written and built for tsunami design. So it really is just you know pertinent to the coastal regions of the U.S., but you know, including Oregon. Um, and a big part with that is like, yeah, you don't want to site essential facilities or dangerous facilities. So you don't want to site a school in the tsunami zone. You don't want to site facilities like this in the tsunami zone, just because, yeah, regardless of if it can withstand the earthquake. Cool, thank you. Tsunamis are pretty bad, but the typhoons, I thought it was worse. There's like <clears throat> hurricane too, pulling all the cars all over the place. Mm -hmm. It's like Hi guys, our group has chosen to present um, about the groundwater contamination in Eastern Oregon, specifically in Morrow and Umatilla counties. We wanted to present a topic that was current, somewhat local. Um, my group member, Jazira, actually has grandparents who live in the Umatilla Morrow area and are experiencing this problem firsthand. So what's going on in the groundwater in uh, Morrow and Umatilla County? The groundwater is testing at high levels of nitrates and is unhealthy for consumption. Uh, we've identified five sources of contamination. We've got irrigated agriculture, food processing, wastewater, animal operations like dairy feedlots, sewage from septic tank systems, and the U.S. Army uh, Umatilla Chemical Depot's bomb washout beginnings. Even though these sources can be identified, um, they've been difficult to diagnose and remedy. I would argue to say that most of these are non-point sources, and by their very nature, they're difficult to diagnose and remedy. The state of Oregon um, has known about the contamination since 1989, so for over 30 years. A committee was created a year later in 1990. Uh, unfortunately, Nitrate levels continue to exceed the federal safe drinking water standard in this area to that day, or to this day, and can cause uh, respiratory infections, thyroid dysfunctions, and bladder cancer. You can see on this map of uh, the Umatilla Basin in October of 2020, all of that red indicates high levels of nitrates um, and the vast area that it's affecting. So what went wrong? Uh, a, the committee that was formed has too much interest in protecting their own agriculture and industrial businesses. Uh, B, the state of Oregon and DEQ uh, appear to be turning a blind eye to all the concerns of the EPA while uh, multiple entities continue to fail their wastewater tests. And lastly, individuals uh, with private wells are unable to uh, afford the filtration systems. Um, 
I'm going to hand it over to Julian now to talk about what we learned and the, some potential solutions. Yeah, so for the uh, lessons learned, uh, so for digging a well, it's, you know, it's better, it's safer to uh, actually test the, the ground soil for contaminants before you use the money, you know, for digging and say the resources. Um, and there's obvious, you know, health risks. It's not safe to drink nitrate contaminated water. Um, it's sort of making you, uh, um, you know, giving a birth defects. Um, it's also important to uh, spread awareness on the issue. Um, it is pretty common, you know, throughout agriculture, um, you know, and the outskirts of the city, you know, there, there will be crop fields, so there will be pesticides that will be used. And uh, nitrate, it sort of lingers in the ground for a while, so it's, you know, it's a long-term environmental consequence. Um, but for solutions uh, we came up with, uh, just a water treatment, um, you know, this is, the most priciest, uh, you know, cost it costs like millions to uh, maintain. Uh, there are personal water treatment systems like um, it's called reverse osmosis and the ion exchange systems, but even then, it's still pricey, you know, for uh, individual families to maintain because the higher the contaminant level of uh, nitrate, uh, the more energy is used, you know, to separate the contaminant from the water, and um, you know that uses more money. Um, and then just tighter regulations. I'm sure they try this, you know, with local government, but uh, I'm sure they're getting nowhere, you know, with, you know, permits for water polluting. Um, and just simple well monitoring, um, you know, just regular checks. Uh, you know, if, there's, if, you, if you see that there's a contaminant in your water, it's best not to drink it or use it for cooking. Um, yeah, that's my uh, portion. Um, yeah, so I'll, I went into like finance and um, looked at the um, ion exchange system where it basically takes out contaminating ions from the water and then puts new ones in that are friendlier, um, that aren't poisoning the water supply. Um, and so these range from, you know, individual small like personal ones to, you know, you put in a water treatment system and serve as a whole cis like city. Um, they cost, you know, starting around 1500 and up for the individual ones and, you know, add an extra $700 per person per year for maintenance. Um, and, but in Southern California, there was a, a city that added the ion um, exchanger into their water treatment system and it costs around 5 million to service 75,000 people. So it's, you know, dropping that down to $60 a person. Um, and so this is kind of to say that, you know, government should be the one stepping in and fixing this, either the EPA or <coughs> local agencies. Um, they said earlier that the EPA has been pressuring Oregon, um, being like, hey, if you don't do this, we're going to step in with federal intervention. It's kind of like, why don't you do it now anyways? But um, the Oregon Department of Agriculture actually replied, being like, we don't have any money for this. Sorry. Um, and so this just kind of ends up falling into the hands of the individual people to fix their own water supply. Um, and like it's, it's rural Oregon, so there's not really a lot of money and it's, yeah, it's, it ends up being very difficult for them. Yeah. Yeah. So um, kind of getting into that, uh, this is, Multnomah County is where Portland is located and like a little bit of the surrounding area. And then Morrow County is one of the areas that's affected. Um, uh, their Hispanic population, the one here, is around like like 13%, and over in Morrow County, it is closer to 40%, so it's significantly higher. Um, um, a large portion of their population is Hispanic people, and then additionally, their foreign-born persons percentage is also higher, so a lot of these people have immigrated most likely from Mexico. Um, and then along with that, these people that are immigrating don't necessarily have the same amount of education or access to it. And so um, the percentage of people who have a high school diploma or equivalent is also higher over there compared to compared to Portland. Um, and then also a lot of people will consider Portland as having like quite a high like poverty issue and homelessness issue, but it's kind of surprising because Morrow County happens to have a higher poverty percentage as well. Um, and all of this is just to say that these people can't afford to be outsourcing their water. It's not ethical to have these people have to go out and 
basically fend on their own to get water and not be able to depend on um, the state and the city to provide water for them, especially since it's like very much a basic human need. Um, and also part of the problem is that a lot of these people, since um, agriculture happens to be something that does attract people who are immigrants or um, people who have a lower level of education, that's like where the main demographic is and that's where most of their um, economy is based on is agriculture. And so it's kind of this toss up where we need the agriculture to support these people, but then also the agriculture is essentially poisoning them. Um, and additionally, you have to think about the 10 cent deposit, a lot of like, and I guess it's not something that most people think about, because you can essentially return the bottles, but not all of these people have the time to do that. So it's essentially just an extra tax for something that they have to buy. Like they don't have a choice. Um, and then also because these people are not born in America, they're not necessarily, or they're uneducated, they're not necessarily familiar with the US legal system. And so I feel like the state has been taking advantage of them. And because these people don't know how to fend for themselves or they don't necessarily know how to speak up or what to do to um, move towards getting clean water or maybe possibly getting that paid for, I feel like it's been swept under the rug and not a lot of people are talking about it. And so I feel like the responsibility falls on to other people that hear about it to sort of speak up for them or just like bring light to the issue. Um, yeah. And like, then, yeah. yeah, that goes into like our ethical responsibility. What is our ethical responsibility um, to do something about this problem? Um, as an engineer of any discipline, it is important to realize our day daily decisions not only affect our projects outcome, but our decisions uh, long term effects for our community, safety, welfare, and health. It is clear that the Umatilla Ground Basin Water Management Area is made of financial resources, personal manpower, or people power. Um, and just research in general. Um, this can ensure we are fully addressing and acting on the slow continuing contamination issues. So um, why are the nitrate levels still on the rise? So depending on rainfall averages, soil type, and elevation, rainfall can travel down into our earth, or our earth anywhere from 10 inches to 10 feet. Um, if a private well depth is, near, is ideally around 1,000 feet, so water can take 100 years to 1,200 years to reach down to the bottom. Um, so our, um, right now, we have 198 total wells, and 38 of them are private wells, and those are the ones with the highest nitrate levels. Those are the ones being tested and monitored. So continuing to monitor those um, government assistance in regards to providing home fil filtration systems for private um, well owners, um, something called a DAP filtration system. Uh, it, it's more, uh, it's used in homes. Uh, it does not filter out the nitrate or iron, so that would not be an option. Um, also revising their standard operating procedures. Um, recently looked and saw as of November 4th, 2020, Oregon DEQ appointed a new committee members to help with the uh, restructure. Um, the new member categories for the general public are for the general public and tribal members to better represent the community's concern. And lastly, um, rejecting payouts. It seems that companies, um, Lamb Weston, French Fry Plant, Oregon Potato Company, and the Borman's Food Processing are all located in the Port of Merrill. They have been fined over. The, the total amount is $1.3 million in the last four years, but the issue is they just keep paying the money. Um, and I think that if we stop allowing that and reassign those areas to have new workers, new policies, um, that would probably help instead of continuing just to take money and not just take it on. Any questions? <coughs> If you know, you know what's like, uh, is this a long-term accumulation of agricultural practices over the last you know, hundred years, or is it more due to more recent agricultural activities? From some of the articles, it just looks like what we're adding to the fertilizer, like the non-organic, uh, the nitrate. Uh, yeah, the what we're adding, and it's just it's leaching down. So I don't know. If 
what testing was done to see how long that lasts or is, it, is this uh Hermiston? Is that in this area? Yeah, it's like yeah. Hermiston, Oregon, Pasco area. Yeah, because I know we'll, I think sometimes in the last several decades when someone with cheese started getting all their cows or their largest cow um, production area is in that area. Um, so. Okay, it's just, it's just all that. Doing it again. Okay. Okay. Stop. <coughs> good morning, oh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are uh, week number nine, and today we'll be taking you to Romania to discuss the Via Mare Dance Barrier. I'm Harper. I'm Alexandra. Nora. Um, so on January 30th, 2000, um, the Bayamari Dam failed, spilling um, over 100,000 cubic meters of cyanide waste into the Bay from the Bayamari Arul Gold Mine tailing basin in Romania. Um, tailings are uneconomic waste products left over from mining, often in the form of gang. And tailing basins are permanent embankment <coughs> dams used to hold tailings, um, and they're made larger as more waste is created and added to the dam. And some of these are actually some of the largest um, engineering structures on Earth. Um, and the, this dam specifically was built um, jointly by the Romanian government and the um, Australian mining company, uh, Esmeralda. Um, the specific engineering faults with it were that it was incorrectly built with sandy rather than rocky soil, weakening it significantly. Um, it, there was no upkeep involved in it. Generally, you know, you make it larger, you build the wall higher, and you fortify it, and none of that was done. And um, there was continually dumping of waste into this weakened structure. Um, it finally uh, uh, broke open just months after it was built um, due to precipitation of 160 millimeters going over the 118 millimeter limit of the dam, causing 25 meters of the dam wall to wash away. Um, societally, this caused widespread cyanide poisoning, um, death of crops and livestock, worsening relations between Romania, Hungary, Serbia, and Yugoslavia, as well as other countries in the area. And environmentally, there was a huge loss of wildlife, cyanide, and cyanide in a World Heritage Site, um, the Hordovaji National Park, um, areas protected by the Ramsar Convention, and areas pre protected by the MAB program under UNESCO. So a lot of the lessons that can be learned come from a design and planning phase. The first one being mindful placement of these leaching facilities and dams. The gold mine was located just feet away from the Soames River, which flowed into the Danube, the second longest river in Europe. Millions of people live along this river and depend on it for its water. Also, the construction of tailing dams and external dikes. This would have prevented spilling from water overflow from uh, storm events or just overall dam failure. This could have helped prevent the whole cyanide spill. Another lesson that can be learned is the importance of improved connection networks, especially between governments. It took over 10 hours for the Romanian government and the Environmental Protection Agency to even be alerted about this spill. So thousands of citizens drank water, bathed with the water that they didn't even know was infected with cyanide. Another important lesson is just the importance of strict regulations and quality inspections. The Biomari Dam actually passed inspections from the engineering agency and the government, even though the design was faulty and led to this disaster. Lastly, an important lesson is having improved designs for dams. The materials used to construct the dam was leaking before it was even functional. 
They also, as Barbara mentioned, they use a very fine sandy material instead of a coarser rock material, which was a poor design for a dam. And the social and racial implications, the people living in the countries of Romania, Slovakia, Hungary, Serbia, and Bulgaria near the contaminated river systems were the ones that suffered the most consequences. Uh, cyanide is lethal, even in very small amounts to humans, plants, and animals. Um, some of the symptoms, if you have exposure to cyanide, can include anything from chest pain, confusion, dizziness, headaches, nausea, eventually, seizures, coma, and death. So the metropolitan area right around the spill had a population of around 140,000 at the time. Um, it's estimated that 2.5 million Hungarians had their drinking water contaminated. Farmers near the river system suffered loss of crops, contaminated groundwater, and also loss of livestock. It's estimated that 15,000 people in the fishing industry lost their jobs as well, due to more than 650 tons of fish dying being poisoned from cyanide. Uh, the eating of contaminated fish accounted for up to 100 hospitalizations. Most of those were children because the smaller body sizes, they're much more affected by the cyanide than an adult would be. A lack of regulations in the mining industry exploited by that Australian company, Esmeralda Exploration, that owned a large stake in that mining company, uh, disproportionately affected the rural communities <coughs> more, um, where there is much higher levels of poverty in the rural communities outside of the, the big cities. All right, well, now that you guys heard about what happened and what went wrong, we're going to talk some about some of the ethical issues. And when addressing environmental disasters, we have responsibility both on an individual level and a societal level. We'll start with the individual level. We, of course, have all have a moral duty. And I'm going to sound like the announcer at the airport here. When you see something, you say something. I'm sure there, that went to a bunch of people that saw there was fault in the building while building the dam. Everyone approved it, everyone moved on, and people suffered. So, of course, I'll go back to it. When you see something, say something. We need to act, we need to put up help. If it's cleanup or we need to sound the alarm if necessary, it's just depending on the situation, of course. Um, we also, uh, uh, as consumers, we need to uh, look at the companies that we're buying things from. Look at the companies that we're investing our money in from. Are they protecting the environment? Are they using their resources properly? And the most uh, important, the most important one, of course, is promoting re uh, responsible use for our natural resources and also uh, protection for our natural resources. And now when we talk about the societal level, as a society, we are responsible to enact and enforce laws and regulations that protect the environment and reduce risks to disasters like this one. I'm sure you heard it from what both of my teammates have been mentioned, laws and regulations, laws and regulations. And I think we all all keep falling back on that and apply, I'm sure, to all of our failures here. Um, we also should provide education and awareness program to inform the people um, of the environment risks and where they're living and if there is and could be an environment uh, risk to their problem, their health, of course. And last but not least, <coughs> transparency and accountability. We need to make sure these companies are held accountable. And we need to make sure they are participating in the cleanup. And that, of course, falls in the long-term planning. Long-term planning, we need to make sure um, things like this doesn't happen. We need to, as we start from the ground up, we need to make sure we check everything. So things like that. Back to the financial opportunities, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, stated that the spill was very similar in size and environmental impact to the 1992 spill in Colorado, and they estimated the cost for cleanup is around $170 million, U.S. dollars. The Hungarian government demanded $100 million, that's in U.S. dollars, a settlement from the mining company for damage to the ecosystem to their tourism, um, and for remediation along the contaminated rivers. Um, it's kind of interesting, if you're following the news stories out of this, it all just cuts off, right? About a year and a half later, September 11th happened, and then this story completely falls out of the headlines, which we kind of see a lot of times with disasters. Once a bigger story, 
kind of catches hold, people kind of stop talking about what's going on. Does anyone have any questions? So what's what's currently the status as far as so they what the you river. can see this picture right here really technologically advanced they put a bunch of sandbags in that area and they didn't really do a whole lot uh, they they just, they just they just the, the um, water is still testing at higher cyanide levels than it should be like in the area I did see um, I think BBC did a did another um, story on it recently and it still has high cyanide levels in the river so they haven't done any cleanup. There are environmental groups in the area that are lobbying for different things and there was a water distribution events in like the bigger cities and towns but unfortunately a lot of the rural populations didn't get access to those kinds of things so they're just kind of having to be stuck with the consequences. So the dams holding back water is it's, it's holding back uh, tailings, which basically is like any waste products that they can't sell after a mining um, uh, operation. So it includes water mixed in with cyanide and heavy metals. And that's okay. You just dump it and put it on the dam. And say, yeah, in Romania, it, it was okay. Yeah. Yes, they so do this. That's... I mean, they do it in Canada and the U.S. too. Um, there's just there's not a good. I think at this point, there's not a great way to uh, process such a large amount of waste material. Um, that won't lose the company's money, so they kind of just look at that and don't fix it. Um, so we put it behind dams for long-term containment. How long was the mine in operation? Um, I don't know about the mine itself. It was in operation for a long time before this specific dam was built. Um, but this one was only up for a couple months before it broke. So. It was broken before operation. Sorry. Yeah. It was leaking in the first place. Yeah, no, because I was going to say, even if there's a dam, like that's just holding one side, but the rest of it's like natural area, right? So it's just leaking into the dam. Well, it had a it had a film that was supposed to um, protect it, but whatever film they used did not work. It was leaking from the beginning. You can kind of see in the picture, it looks like a big black tarp almost, mm -hmm. but yeah. they had a lot of heavy snow and rain, a big weather event, and it kind of eroded the material that shouldn't have been made out of that material to begin with. So it was just a faulty design. All right, so where are we at now? So we're group 10, so we've got two order groups, there's a long VA, there's a lot of Okay, so our group, uh, we're group 10, we did Chernobyl, um, I'm Mila, I'm Anita, Maddie. Good to see you. Uh, Alex. All right, so basically Chernobyl was the world's largest nuclear power plant incident. It happened in Chernobyl, Ukraine on April 26, 1986. The main reason behind why it went wrong was because they were doing a safety test because the water pump wasn't working for the reactor. And the test was done by an untrained night shift crew who ignored safety procedures by putting the reactor on a low power mode. And then not wanting to wait 24 hours to bring the power back on, they decided to put control rods back in, which caused a power surge, which caused a steam explosion, and then a chemical explosion, releasing radiation. Yeah, and uh, the 1986 disaster of Chernobyl, this was not just a, um, a Ukraine problem or a U USSR problem, but it affected everybody and societies and, and um, ecosystems. And according to the International Atomic Energy Association, the IAEA, um, it says there were um, included 350 that were um, evacuated, those that got contaminated across large areas of Europe. I see um, here is not just Ukraine, but Belarus, and Russia, um, and other places of Europe too. And it's also included the 4,000 youth and children that contaminated thyroid cancer, and 
um, it wasn't just the people that got hurt, that got um, impacted, but the people that knew them, their families, their co-workers, these are the ones that were impacted. And disasters don't, they hurt everybody, and oftentimes psychological impacts of trauma last a lifetime. The second lesson was um, the importance of national regulation as um, the question for worldwide safety and regulation was instantly brought up from this disaster as it was kind of kind of beat around the bush but never really talked about. This really sparked much needed conversation as um, as all countries understood and they, they started to comprehend the dangers of weakly regulated not, um, nuclear facilities. And the third lesson was the importance of national communication and we can see that the, what happened at Chernobyl um, actually sparked uh, national inter international collaboration which something was made up um, called the Chernobyl Forum where um, the collaboration of, an or of organizations and countries it allowed the necessary collaboration of many gifted scientists, experts and leaders to help create that um, Chernobyl Forum. And to fix it, we have two um, solutions. Really, there's the first one of working on prevention from these things happening in the future with strong regulations and safety requirements for nuclear facilities. And for the second one, we can't really fix natural disasters as there are lifelong impacts from um, psychological impacts. But we could fund those that are impacted and look into a, a fund the organizations that help those people and aid those people that are impacted in areas and environments that were damaged. On to the social and economic implications. Um, everybody in the surrounding area was uh, affected by the radiation from the explosion. Uh, the immediate consequences were the death of the workers involved as well as like, any animals in the surrounding area. Um, anybody in the red zone Two red zones contracted um, acute radiation sickness, which led to death of both animals, plants, and people. Um, in the following hours after the explosion, um, all industrial and agricultural operations had to cease working, um, which led the estimated population of 4 million people, um, many of which who worked there, just uh, to leave and evacuate. And they had to go and like seek asylum in what is like now modern day Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine. Um, and then long term implications are the United Nations uh, released a paper in 2018 that showed that there was a spike in thyroid cancer in children and adolescents that were directly uh, related in, in uh, those areas. Um, they also had some links to birth defects. Um, but they weren't able to prove that with their research, so they had to not really be able to cite them. Um, I'll take other ethical responsibilities. Um, as engineers, um, our job is very significant the fact that everybody is dependent on us. So we have the ethical responsibility to keep everybody safe and make sure our projects are going forward in a safe manner. Um, our first concern is prioritize like the safety of others as well as ourselves. Um, this specific facility is like within like 10 miles of a city. So that's obviously not safe and on top of it, the explosion. Um, a lot of radioactive material was like passed through the air, very like very far. Um, it says that the initial at the initial explosion three people died, but the other side said that like more than around 50 people died. Um, and a lot of the people who were first responders there um, after like, a while they ended up dying as well and they didn't even have like, a proper mural, mural because it wasn't like safe to stay near one. Um, we should make sure that people overseeing hazardous facilities are qualified and trained. The people who are overseeing those facilities are just they're not trained. Um, and we should also make sure that decisions are thoroughly revised and approved. And when projects don't go as, as planned, like it's because people aren't in charge, don't know what they're doing, or just because there's an honest mistake, uh, we should like fix it immediately and with integrity. And the people involved in this, they didn't, they actually try to cover it up um, until like, they were pressed by something and they found out that they couldn't do it. Um, so, how did we fund this? Um, since the nuclear power plant was situated in the 
Soviet, uh, the sorry, the Ukrainian Soviet uh, Republic, the Soviet Union was like they provided uh, the majority of the funding um, for the to repair the aftermath of the disaster. Um, the immediate response to the situation, which was handled by the Soviet government, created the construction of the Chernobyl shelter, which is basically like a, a concrete sarcophagus. It's like a tomb that like enclosed the damaged reactor to make sure none of that radiation continued to like spill out. And I believe in the 2000s, it began, it began to crumble. So um, they shut that down and they started um, building a another type of dome and they put over the reactor again and that cost about three billion dollars and they only estimated it to last about 100 years which is not good <laughs> um so so they uh they also resettled all the affected populations as well as creating the chernobyl exclusion zone and worldwide assistance was also provided in addition to funding from the Soviet government. Um, so as mentioned before, this re this event really like brought together many nations to help each other, and the U.S. the U.S. nations and other European nations provided financial aid and funded charities as well as expertise and supplies, and. So this recovery was a huge team effort. Um, so with all the current environment and healthcare monitoring, um, the Chernobyl aftermath is still an ongoing effort to this day. Um, overall, I believe the Soviet um, paid eighteen billion dollars. I think they're called rubles, their currency, which in U.S. dollars is about seventy billion dollars. Yeah, but like, it's like an ongoing thing right now. So. They're still funding this disaster to this day. Yeah, the area is still not. It's all these things. Um, the you can still visit this area to this day, which is it's actually pretty stupid. Yeah. And like, they have to do like a radiation test right after you leave the area too. Yeah, going back a little bit, just you can see that this. All these effects actually just they continue on as a lot of the traumatic um, disasters they have like um, effects that pass down generationally it's not just people that are directly there but it's a whole it's a whole um, impact and you can just you can just fix it and it's something that will move on as a society and collaborate to prevent things from happening in the future thank you Is the red picking? Uh, so that was just the initial zone, just flow like zone, okay. and then the contamination spread all the way out to the yellows, which is the unnamed zone. So it's just like what they have less like, okay. information on. And how large is the actual exclusion zone? Um, sorry, this is like not blown up very well. Um, they had it in the pictures, and yeah. I can't remember. The for that. Okay, so the way that I remember it, just one building that's not like two separate facilities. So why is there like one area of like mass radiation and another one far away from it? Um, so it's mostly due to like wind and the actual radiation being carried over. Yeah, because Chernobyl was just right near the actual plant, right. but it got carried over here. Okay. Yeah. All right, on to group 11. All right. Okay. Oh, that's handy. Uh, so Lars went to the uh, 
in order to use that uh, cell here from Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Um, Cole, please. Paige. Miss Scott. Come on. I'm going to be providing a little bit of the background. Hurricane Katrina was one of the most powerful Atlantic storms on record. The winds excess from 107 miles per hour made landfall in the morning of August 29th. The storm surge hit Gulfport and Biloxi, Mississippi, and again traveled to New Orleans. The spawning collection of levees was constructed in the Mississippi uh, Delta. Then New Orleans over 200 years ago by maintaining army corps. Engineers were overwhelmed as well. By afternoon of the 29th, 20% of the city was underwater. By August 30th, the city was 80% underwater. Mayor Ray Nazan ordered a mandatory evacuation of the city and one function million people left the city that day. Tens of thousands of re residents remained in the city. Many sought refuge in the Superdome and Convention Center where conditions were extremely poor. Local and federal agencies were overwhelmed and struggled to provide adequate support and shelter for refugees. And as you can see on the graph up here, it says 17 Street Canal Breach. Deflection of the eye wall by the surge waves and dual hydrostatic pressure along all split levees into two blocks. Weak clay below falls along allowing the protected half of the levy to be displaced. Uh, for the financing aspect, uh, it originally was thought to be about 3.1 billion. Uh, and then after the uh, Army Corps of Engineers uh, started working on it, it went up to 14 billion. Uh, the project took about 10 years to uh, fully construct the uh, rebuild of it. Um, but in the two years, they needed upgrades for about half a billion or half a billion dollars uh, because New Orleans is sinking and the water's rising, so they need to build up higher. Uh, so roughly it's about 14.5 billion uh, in total. Mm -hmm. um, and then the state of Louisiana had to pay 35% uh, of it um, through uh, sales tax of that year and then uh, old, uh, money overflow from the previous year. And then from uh, like tips and then uh, donations from uh, communities that uh, are uh, being supported by the levy. Okay, so um, there are a few types of levy failures. There's overtopping, which is when water levels pour over the crest elevation of the levy, and they flow into the protected area. There's scouring or sliding of the foundation, um, which can lead to breaching, which is where the levee wall breaks and, uh, or slides away. Or there's seepage and piping of the levee body, which is when the water moves away from the river channel, um, either below or through the levee and surrounding land surface. So some contributing hazards to the New Orleans area included a um, combination of soft, compressible organic soils, an intense development from rapid growth of fisheries, gas, port commerce, and tourism industries, which resulted in more than half of the ground surface in the protected area behind the levees to be below sea level by as much as 10 to 12 feet in some locations. So since the protected area forms a bowl below sea level, all the rainwater, um, an average of 60 inches in a year, and interior drainage must be pumped up and out of the development behind the levees. So 169 miles of levees were damaged with over 50 breaches documented, which increased flooding by 300%. 46 of these breaches were due to overtopping and overwash by the heavy coastal storm surge and wave attack. Four of these 50 breaches occurred prior to overtopping in areas along the interior drainage canals where eye walls had been constructed on top of earthen levees. These four walls collapsed before water reached design levels and these four locations accounted for 75% of the fatalities. So for three of these failures, under flood load, a gap formed at the face of the buried eye wall, which permitted hydrostatic forces to penetrate down into the levee embankment section and foundation. Um, this split the section and resulted in a rapid sliding failure. 
So a uh, little side note, hydrostatic forces are resultant forces caused by pressure loading of liquid acting on submerged surfaces, uh, in case you were wondering. So the gaps were observed during the core, um, the core's E99 load tests of the eye wells during design, um, but then they were ignored. So the fourth failure was attributed to internal erosion and uplift caused by the presence of continuous, highly permeable zones in the foundation solids. So some other contributing failures, um, margin of safety was too low every step of the way. There was no independent review. Um, the pumping system was only designed for rainfall, so uh, it was pretty useless. Um, levee construction happened over 40 years, leaving some sections too low or incomplete. Um, environmental considerations did not adequately consider life um, safety concerns and local affordability impacted operation and maintenance. So what did we learn? Um, so there's new analytical techniques that have been developed which can evaluate both synthetic and observed storms, including their impact on surge and wave effects, providing system-wide evaluations on complex projects. Improved risk analysis techniques and tools for levees fully integrate hydrologic loading, system performance, and consequences to clearly identify system vulnerabilities. Another little aside, hydrologic, hydrologic loading refers to surface loads based on the mass of water stored in soil, soil moisture, snow, and in vegetation. Um, it's critical to understand soil structure interactions, particularly related to failure modes and systems with eye walls embedded in earthen levees. And it can be more effective to address large coastal storms beyond the perimeter of developed areas rather than at the limits of development, including physical interactions of system elements, the effects of deep, broad floodplains, transition points in the line of defense, coincident river and coastal flooding events, and long period waves. So improved policy and practice has been developed for more resilience to overtopping and overwash effects, including surface armoring, armoring transition points, armoring behind flood walls, and um, design of intentional overtopping locations. So also, um, we have a better understanding of the importance and role of natural systems of vegetation and land accretion on the coastal side of levee systems and reducing flooding effects. Uh, last little aside, accretion is when bodies of water deposit soil onto a property, increasing its area and value. Um, so this understanding has led to improved nature-based solutions. Yeah, um, the social and the, the racial issues <coughs> were, were far-reaching and, and quite terrible. Um, there was the official reports that 682 people died. Some people said it's as many as four now. Um, many of these people were um, poor, elderly, um, living in nursing homes and hospitals where the power went out, the water went out. Um, a lot of people went to the Superdome in the convention center where the conditions were really bad. There was no plumbing, <coughs> there was no um, running water, there was no lighting in many cases. Um, so a lot of people lost their homes. Many of these were poor people who um, couldn't afford to rebuild when um, the storm was over. Um, as many as a million people were likely permanently displaced because they, they couldn't come back and, um, and rebuild their homes. Um, there was also many and widespread incidences of um, socioeconomic based violence. In, um, in one area, Algiers Point, um, 11 block black people were shot by vigilantes. Um, two people died in that incident. Um, also, uh, Poor black people, mostly poor black people, tried to escape their neighborhoods by going across um, Crescent City and the Danziger Bridges. Um, at the Danzinger Bridge, the police shot and killed two people and um, forced people to turn back. Uh, there was also widespread and unlawful constitution of guns. People went, um, police went door to door, um, confiscating citizens locked in on firearms. Um, one incident was recorded on video where an elderly woman was beaten and dragged from her home for having an unloaded 38 caliber firearm. So, um, yeah, pretty bad. All right, and our responsibility is that 
should have been up north and not in Sierra State as well. It's also up to people before and after the hurricane has hit. Uh, specifically, as Scott had mentioned, uh, the social and racial issues, uh, the gun violence, and people trying to talk about their information sessions, and also soldiers being um, blamed off by the National Guard. Uh, so that was just the, the main social part of it. More specifically, for engineers, they definitely should have implemented more uh, peer review language when they made this design, and they even reported it multiple times that it needed to be fixed or updated because the way the levee was built, as mentioned, the erosion was going to wash away eventually, and they knew that was going to happen. And it was even warm about it, that's why it was just trying to sleep so early. And it was just it was not acted on. So basically, engineers just need to do uh, that kind of inspection before and after the design is made. I think they were just trying to maintain control of the situation. Um, I think there was just a lot of hasty decisions made by leadership. And, um, you know, the cops got the order, don't let these areas get flooded by people, and then they just shut it down. So, uh, has the entire network been upgraded though? That 14 billion? I think there's still been repairs. So, like, uh, so after the 10 years, they have to do like half, another half a billion dollars because it's like sinking and the water's rising. So, it's just going to be a continuous process like that. Um, so yeah. are, are they saying that if we get another hurricane, Trina, that we won't get a repeat? Yeah, I can answer that question. So, we actually just had a hurricane. So we actually just had a hurricane that was worse than hurricane in terms of like the actual power of the hurricane. And the name is like missing right now, but uh, because our levees are built up a little bit better now, it is what the flood water that was sustained. They redesigned them to be wider too, and there's yeah. a lot more mileage. And there's more space between like the actual uh, uh, water line and like, the levee line. So mm -hmm. they're going to have to like right up against each other. Um, so if you have your scorecard and you want to hand it in now, I'll take it. Uh, you can just kind of put it up here, just put it uh, face down. If you want to hold on to it and uh, email it to me, that also is acceptable. Do you want these back? I don't need the rubric, just the uh, scorecards themselves. Okay.